Hey YouTubers, it's me, Lonnie Clark again, that's for art. Um, I guess I'm not very good at getting back to you like every single day. I have a lot going on. Uh, this morning I decided I think what I'm going to do is from now on I'm going to wake up an extra half an hour early in the morning before I do the radio show and try to finish the readings in the morning because I usually wait till the evening time till my day is done and there just doesn't seem to be enough of me. But uh, thank you for joining me. Thank you for coming back. I'm going to continue reading this. I know it's really for posterity's sake. And um, this may not be interesting reading for lots of people. I find it fascinating. More than anything, I think it's important for us to get this digitalized and into somewhere so that Dr. Goffman's ideas and thoughts don't just go away. So we are finishing reading Human Radiation Studies, Remembering the Early Years, Oral History of Dr. John W. Goffman, Ph.D., M.D., conducted December 20th, 1994, by the United States Department of Energy, Office of Human Radiation Experiments, June 1995. This is stunning. They actually had a Department of Human Radiation Experiments. This is why I think it's important for us to read it. So we are at the heart disease studies, and I'm going to take off my glasses so I can read. So Hefner is talking to Dr. Goffman, and she says, Let's talk about the heart disease studies. How did that occur, and how did that grow out of your research? Goffman, Well, it grew out of this. I came back to Berkeley. As a young assistant professor, you'd expect to start some research. And this first six months, I didn't have any good ideas about cancer, which I thought I might work on. But I had one idea about heart disease and cholesterol, which was poo-pooed at the time as just a bunch of nonsense. Didn't seem like nonsense to me. I felt maybe the reason why it had just such a bad name was that it didn't have the technology to study how blood transport cholesterol. So I decided to look at how blood transports cholesterol. There were two avenues that were then in existence. One is the result of the war years and the blood fractionization to get blood products for the military. At Harvard, they used what's called the slow salt ethanol methods of isolating fractions of the various protein albumin, albumin glucobin. They showed that some of the cholesterol was carried in certain of these fractions. Interestingly enough, I think we know lots of this, and he was the pioneer in this information. At the same time, a physical chemist and associate of the Svedberg, the great Swedish physical chemist who invented the ultracentrifuge, Kai Peterson, had written the monograph in 1946 or 1947 on the ultracentrifugation of serum. He wrote, quote, Serum is a non-ideal thing to study because there are some unstable molecules in the serum and you can't get any result that you want from the ultracentrifuge. And you can get any result you want from the ultracentrifuge. His whole thesis was, don't do it with blood. But we had just acquired at Donner through the way of facilitating the study of large molecules, the second ultracentrifuge that was built in America. Melvin Calvin got the first one. We got the second one. We decided that we could find out, at least we ought to see, if we got the same results as Kai Peterson. And we did. It looked crazy as hell. It seemed as if it seemed as though if you just breathe on the serum, you would get a different answer. One thing our ultra centrifuge di one thing in our ultra centrifuge diagrams, it didn't look as though it was a problem of unstable molecules. We got what's called a dip below the waistline. We never should have gotten a dip below the baseline. Frank Lundgren and I puzzled and puzzled over this. I think Frank was the one who finally had an idea. We tested that there might be some way of low density in the solution that could move either way, depending on whether you were in the solution that had the proteins in it or the solution free of proteins. 
It all opened up because we were able to explain everything about the so-called unstable molecules of Peterson. There were no unstable molecules. It was just that you were dealing with something with a density close to the density of liquid. Depending on slight changes in sodium chloride or sugar concentration, those things would get crazy patterns. But all the craziness disappeared. AEC Support for Heart Disease Study Gorley Was AEC interested in this? And AEC, by the way, means Atomic Energy Commission. That, that was the name of the NRC before they changed their name. Goffman, not terribly, they weren't. The AEC did support my work. How did that work? asked Gorley. Goffman, why did the AEC support it? Yes, asked, Goff asked Gorley. Goffman, AEC supported Donner Lab as an entity, so I shared in that support. But actually, as a matter of a fact, with an expansion of that work, Warren Shields, who was then head of the AEC's Division of Biology and Medicine, suggested that we get an American Heart Institute support. And I did. A lot of money from the heart support and a number of private grants, too. Because of the AEC, we were doing some things with tracers and, a, and the study and lip, lipoproteins but they didn't regard it as the mainline AEC work. That's why I did get the additional support from the Heart Institute. But the initial support was because we were all in AEC lab. Gorley, right. Hefner asked, so there really is no close connection between the blood lipids and your radiation sickness study? Goffman, there were some. Two of my graduates, one of them is an adjunct professor now, Tom Hayes and John Hewitt, were doing studies on lipoproteins in connection with fatal irradiation. Saw some very interesting effects of the lipo lipoproteins that were predictive of whether animals would live or die with radiation. There was a big AE e AEC interest in that aspect of the work. Gorley. So did you work on that? Goffman, yes. They were graduate students of mine, but that wasn't my main line. My main line was the heart disease aspects. We were able to show that lipoprotein levels were predictive of heart disease. New subtitle. Heparin and lipoprotein research with human subjects. Hefner. Is there any connection with this heart research with heparin treatment tested at the time. Goffman. Yes, one of my graduate students, Dean Graham, had noted that there was a paper by Paul Hahn, H-A-H-N, from the University of Tennessee that showed that when he gave dogs heparin injections, their blood might have been cloudy with fatty glob globules, globules but it cleared up after the injection. We had this elegant technique by then. We could study the lipoproteins in this centrifuge, ultra centrifuge. Some of us took some heparin by injection. Dean studied the blood and he just cleared out some of the lipoproteins with the heparin infusion. Then we tried to do it in a test tube and that didn't work. But if the person was injected with heparin and we drew the blood, then that blood would cause the, would cause the test tube alterations in the lipoproteins. These people are mad dogs injecting themselves with shit. Bernard Shore, the graduate student of mine, finally proved that the effect of heparin was to release into the bloodstream an enzyme which is called lipoprotein lipase. We thought that the heparin story was of course obvious, of obvious importance for the whole question of management of lipoprotein. Endothelial cells under heparin released excuse me, endo, endo 
epithelial cells under heparone, activated release of the lipoprotein lipase from the endothelial cells. We were hopeful of really doing some management of the whole problem of abnormal lipo lipoproteins with the heparone, but that was not easy. I probably injected myself 150 times during heparin experiments we did on ourselves. Wow, fucking mad dogs. Really, and we expect them to care about us. They're injecting themselves. <laughs> okay, uh, I see we're at 10 minutes. I'm going to keep going a little bit more. So why don't you comment about that too? Here we are in the context of this interview about human radiation experiments and you've drawn a pretty stark contrast of today's human use standards versus then. Why don't you comment on the contrast? Hafner asked that question. Goffman. Max Biggs, who came back later to Livermore and took over the medical department for me, was doing a PhD thesis. He had his medical degree from Harvard and did some work on people with these abnormalities of lipoproteins. He did do some tracer work with tritium-based cholesterol in those patients. I can't remember whether Biggs had to go through any committee at all. I don't think we did at that time, but we did an awful lot of experiments on ourselves. Hardin Jones and I, we were interested in what happened acutely after a fatty meal. We were interested in what happened for 24 to 48 hours after giving yourself a heparin injection. We did an awful lot of experimentation on ourselves. Max Biggs' work was, did involve giving some tracer to some of these patients with lipoprotein disorders. Ro Donald Rosenthal did some of that too. Those were the only things that we were using tritium for as a label of cholesterol. Wow. Wow. I don't know about you, this really pisses me off. Imagine if you go to a doctor and they're injecting you with shit, you don't even know what's in there, and they just say, oh, don't worry about it, we need it. You don't even know. Wow, this does make me very angry. My blood is boiling. We found some information about patients at Stockholm, California and Napa, said Hefner. Goffman. We worked a lot with people in psychiatry. How that happened was that Mary Lasker, who died last year of the Lasker Foundation, helped me a great deal with my work. She once said, if all this work of yours on heart disease is correct, which she didn't doubt at all, Shouldn't it apply to stroke and cerebral arterial sclerosis? And I said, well, Mary, it should. But we only have checked this out on the heart disease. We studied hundreds of people with heart disease. That didn't involve injecting them. We got blood from them. I said, I don't know the answer about cerebral disease. And she said, couldn't you find out? And I said, yeah. We can start doing some studies on the correlation between heart disease and brain disease. And she said, how, what will it cost? And I said, about $75,000, maybe put in about $25,000 a year for three years. I wanted the program. She sent me a check for doing the work. That was Mary. Mary of the, Mary Lasker of the Lasker Foundation. Wow. Let's dish out the cash, folks. 1980. I wonder what $25,000 were in those days, the 40s. I wonder what it meant. Wow. <clears throat> to do the whole story, I contacted Alex Simon, who is a professor of psychiatry at UC here in San Francisco. He's a wonderful guy. And Nathan Malamud, who worked on cerebral pathology. He, Malamud, was also in psychiatry. I went over and talked to him. One of the studies we arranged to do was to get issues from heart and brain in consecutive deaths. Excuse me, I'm going to say that again. One of the studies we arranged to do was to get tissues from heart and brain of consecutive deaths. They get people who died in the mental hospitals. I don't know what, what they had to get in a way of permissions 
to get take these tissues. I just don't know, but they arranged that and we did some studies that were published in the American Journal of Cardiology. Nathan Malamut and Wang Young, a PhD student of mine, and I published a series of three articles in the American Journal of Cardiology on the relationship of cerebral and cor coronary arterial sclerosis. That so reminds me of like, oh, we don't know what they did. We dug up in graves and we just happened to get these dead bodies, right? I don't know what they had to do. It was a mental hospital. They didn't do jack shit. Out of that, we were wondering whether people who had strokes in the mental hospital would show anything. We did some studies of the blood and some studies of people in Stockton and Napa got interested in the possibilities that these lipoproteins might be involved in mental disorders. We did this through Alex Simon's contacts in those places. We arranged studies in both Napa and Stockton State Hospital. No radiation studies, however. Gorley. Where were those studies? What did they involve? Goffman. They involved the study of lipoproteins in their blood. Never any radioactivity involved at all. No tracer studies at all. Hefner. How about any research with Langley Porter Clinic in San Francisco? Were you involved in any research there? Goffman. Just pathology, pathology studies on 100 hearts and brains. It's a classic study. I think it's the best study that had been done at the time. I don't think that anyone had done any better study since the correlation of the amount of arterial sclerosis in one of the 16 cuts of the heart arteries with each other. Then the correlation of the cerebral arterial system of one of the cerebral vessels with the other, and then the intercorrelation between the cerebral and the coronary. In answer to Mary Lasker's questions, does this apply? We concluded that there were two things. One is the interrelationship between disease in the brain and the heart. And two, there is a lot of independence, meaning that there is a local factor in the vessels that partially determine what happens, as well as the general factor such as lipoproteins. The group that I contacted to do, the group that I contacted to do that was Nathan Malamud, the pathologist, and Alex Simon, who were professors of psychiatry at Langley Porter. Hefner, do you have a sense of informed consent at that time? How would it be structured? Goffman, you mean to just mean to just get the arteries in the brain sections of from deceased persons? Yeah, asked Hefner. Goffman, here we go again culpable deniability. I have no idea. My only thing was Alex Simon was a guy who was a doer and Nathan Malamud a shy guy but a superb pathologist. They said yes we can get the hearts and the brains and they did. We young the PhD biophysicist working with me did all the sectioning and staining of the tissues and all of the measurements of those hearts and brains resulting in that series of three papers. I never asked anybody for permission. I didn't know of any, Hefner interrupts and says, any use for internal review board? Goffman. No, I don't remember anything about it at all. I just said, Alex, can you do this? And he said, sure, we'll get the hearts and brains. And they did. I haven't the vaguest idea whether they had to go to anybody. It's not the way things were done. It's not the way things are done today. I can tell you that. Hefner, that's true. It is good to contrast the two to see where we've come. Goffman, the thing the things I did with a lot of people. We were a referral center for the people with these bizarre blood lipoprotein patterns from all over the world. Sometimes, for some of them, I wanted to know whether they would alter their diet. Bill Donalds was the head of the Kral Hospital, the head physician. He was a good friend of John's and Ernest's. I wanted to know a lot of things about diet and lipoproteins. I went over to see Bill Donald and he said, if I can get some cooperation from your dietitian, we could do some inter interesting studies on the arterial sclerosis problems, Bill said. Sure. He introduced me to Virginia Dobbin. 
They set up a diet table and I had between they set up a diet table and I had between four and eight people eating lunch and dinner at the Kral Hospital. Virginia did all the menus. I would tell her we would like to have a high cholesterol diet or a low cholesterol diet, a high fat diet or a low fat diet, or a high animal fat or a low animal fat diet. Alex Nicholas, at that time, he was a professor at the Division of Medical Physics, was a graduate student of mine who got his Ph.D. with me, co-handled that whole diet study. We did a lot of human experimentations in this sense. We had both some students and some of these people referred from around the world. We would have them on one diet or another, and then we'd study their blood every week. Of course, all these people knew they were experimental studies. And we didn't get any permission from anybody to do it, but they never got any radiation. We had that diet table running at Crowell Hospital for a few years. We had excellent cooperation with Virginia Dobbin and my wife, and Hardin's wife, and Tom Lyon's wife. Tom was the cardiologist in San Jose who worked with us, providing us clinical material. The wives wrote a book on low-fat, low-cholesterol diet in 1951. Hefner, the staff wanted me to ask you about that. Goffman, you want to see it? I have it here. It's been revised a few times. It's still selling. Let's see, from 51, that's 43 years. That's a long time for a book. At least they do get some royalties every year under that book. When Alex and I made some major discoveries about carbohydrate and various fats in the diet, he and I and Virginia Dobbin wrote a book about dietary prevention and treatment of heart disease, which is nowhere near as successful as the low-fat, low-cholesterol diet. But damn, it's a good book. So I'm going to end here. I see I'm at 22 minutes. I'm anxious to finish this project. But uh, in uh, the spirit of actually getting it done and making it listenable, I'll stop here. So put your courage feet on, you guys. We are uh, being called to take action by the universe and by Mother Earth and Father Sky to save our planet. So as Glenn says, eyes to the sky, put your courage feet on. Ciao.